So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today for the kickoff of the first interview, IG interview in a series, a new series called Vice Versa. It's uh, a line of interviews where my guest and I switch roles and I get to become the interviewer. So for once, instead of answering questions, I'll be the one asking. My first guest, and what an honor, is Claire Press. Claire, you're an active voice um, and a very passionate voice of sustainable fashion, being the founder of the very acclaimed and one of my favorites um, podcast, The Wardrobe Crisis. You're also the co-host of the podcast called The Fashion or The Ethical Fashion Podcast. In addition to that, Claire and some of you or many of you might already know her because she's a very popular speaker, moderator, host for all the sustainability or fashion sustainability events out there and conferences, fashion weeks and so forth. I think this is a, this is a bonus fact that many of you will appreciate. But Claire Press was actually the first sustainability editor ever appointed at any Vogue globally. It was Vogue Australia who, I believe back in 2018, took, decided to, to, uh, to make the bold move and, um, and include a sustainability editor in their staff. Clara, it's fantastic to see you again. It's been too long. Thank you. What a beautiful introduction. I was just thinking when you said that, that apart from the fact that I have a Danish heart and I always wish that I could be in Copenhagen and I love it, you were actually one of the first people that I really worked closely with when I had that job at Vogue. Um, and I can remember that conversation on the phone because I was basically like, please, can I come to Copenhagen Fashion Summit? Yeah. And we had this great connection and we worked together, didn't we, on some podcasts? Yeah, we did. And yeah, you really helped me get some of that happening. So it was terrific. And for me at that time, and I would ask people who are sort of joining us to just think back. It's not very long ago, but in fact, four years ago, the fashion industry generally outside of the niche of conferences and specific sustainability pioneers, but the fashion industry, fashion weeks, fashion designers, magazines, they weren't talking about this. It was not happening. It was a niche that was sort of over here and the mainstream wasn't so much. And so I remember I just recognized in you someone who was like so ahead of this and I was like, what can we do together? And it's funny because if you fast forward now, um, I think the industry has moved. I think that now it's actually very common for everybody to sit up and take notice and go, well, obviously sustainability, but it wasn't before. No, no, I completely agree. And, and, and just speaking of the before and after, but, but you, I know that you used to like uh, split your, your life between London and Australia, but you've been in Australia for this past year, I think, right? I've yeah. been in this wardrobe for this a year. Um, yeah, so I used to travel half the year and I'm British, but I'm married to a lovely Australian yeah. and I would spend a lot of time in Europe. And so to travel to Copenhagen from London or I used to go to Milan a lot was very easy. Wow. But obviously COVID's changed everything for everybody. And I'm extremely lucky to be here in Sydney where I am now um, because we are, we've, we've really not had much COVID here and we've had extremely, you know, we've just been very lucky. There's a lot of freedom here. The world is, right now, there's extraordinary suffering happening all over the world due to COVID. So I'm not going to complain about that. But will we, will we move? No, we won't. They're yeah. saying we will not, not yet. Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, it's this whole, and I'm, I'm really mindful of how we talk about this because look what's happening in India right now. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous to be saying, oh, poor me, I can't go somewhere. It's just not the point. But I think what is interesting is that for the industry, we've had to accelerate digital strategies in a way that we as an industry, I don't think had planned for out at this scale. And I think it's been good. I think um, being forced to rethink the ways we do business and communicate has actually been um, probably a positive thing. What do you think? I mean, coming from the fashion week angle, it's very hard, right? Yeah, no, I think uh, I completely agree because, I, you know, the, the nature of Copenhagen Fashion Week is obvious or any fashion week is a very, it's a very physical nature, you know, where we have a physical event that takes place in a city, you know, hence the name, you know, obviously yeah. always uh, before the fashion week part. So Copenhagen Fashion Week because it takes, takes place in Copenhagen. Um, and, you know, it's all about, you know, the connection that goes on between people, the way that you experience yeah. clothes or the new collections and so forth. It's a very physical nature. 
which has definitely been challenged, obviously, by, mm -hmm. by this pandemic. But uh, now, you know, fast forwarding one year, because that, you know, this past one year has definitely been a roller coaster ride, as it has mm -hmm. been for so many people professionally. Um, but I, I think, um, I, or I know that we have benefited immensely from, mm -hmm. you know, being forced to, to look into the digital opportunities and, and solutions. Um, and, and, and it's, it's all, you know, we have, we've developed something that we're never going to refrain from, but no. of course I hope that we'll, I hope that we'll get to meet physically again and we'll get to, you know, experience fashion again, uh, physically intact, you know, in a tactile way, but with all yeah. the, all the digital elements that have really, I think, elevated, uh, our fashion week, um, yeah, we'll continue doing that. I'm like the worst person to interview, aren't I? Because I just completely derail all the plans that you probably you had to ask me questions. It's, <laughs> I think it's a good, maybe, maybe that's that that should be the format of this interview. It's called vice versa. So we just keep going back and forth, ping pong. No, but, but actually, <laughs> so in order, thank you for the cue. Um, no, but so let's start the interview properly though, because I know I did a short presentation of you. Um, you're obviously the expert. So, so Claire, the expert of yourself, please tell oh, right. us. <laughs> more about yourself your your path and your career and your, your journey just briefly thank you i mean i won't go on too much about this but i would say that um if you don't know what i do and you're watching this um i was trying to think of like how i would even describe what i do i used to be a journalist and my background is in fashion magazines but these days i don't think that's what i do anymore i certainly don't work in fashion magazines but I was trying to think like, how would I describe what I do? Because I'm not the expert. I'm actually some sort of conduit that tries to bring together experts and stories and try to make them accessible for people. Yeah. So I think what I am is, I'm certainly a podcaster. And as you mentioned, I host a, two podcasts, Wardrobe Crisis, and then one for the UN called Ethical Fashion. But I think what I actually do is try to be some glue and yeah. some kind of, um, conduit to bring together all these amazing people who are experts doing incredible things and people who maybe don't know so much about sustainability but would like to and just want to be able to find a way through and I think that's what I am I don't know if that's the job title but I think maybe I'm a storyteller but I feel like my job is to just try to bring together some of this hard stuff and try to find a pathway through it for people I don't know if that makes sense. I, it it makes a lot of sense to me also as as a listener of your of your podcast and and also having worked with you you know professionally and we hopefully will continue to work together professionally. But that's that's I mean I um, if I should just say it, you know briefly I I learn from you and the people that you bring in and the yeah. voices that you decide to feature on your podcast and um and your ideas in general so I, I i completely uh i completely see where you're coming from as like the the conduit or the glue of of um you know having people engage and also engage in the in the you know important uh discussions that we need to have and yeah and of course an activist or an advocate of sustainable fashion mm. first and foremost because you're probably i think you're one of the persons that i know who's definitely like the most passionate about it and and <laughs> So excellent at um, you know at at giving your audience the same feeling of passion around it. I think. I think I'm sort of a professional pain in the ass because I ask a lot of questions. That's a very British thing to say, isn't it? But it's like I just want to know the answers, and I'm not the expert. So I'm I'm going along this. I hate the word journey, but you know this road with the listeners of the podcast or anyone who is engaging with the work that I do. And I don't know, so I want to find out. So mm -hmm. I feel like I'm very curious. I am. I like. I ask a lot of questions because I'm trying to try and get to the roots of all this difficult yeah. stuff. But I am passionate. I'm passionate about seeing a different fashion industry. I worked in fashion for 20 years. Um, I have worked in fashion for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And in my previous life, I worked pretty much selling new clothes, which was fine because I love clothes and I still love fashion. Mm -hmm. I'm not on the outside shouting about fashion. I'm actually on the inside trying to change fashion together with the industry. And I, but having spent sort of a lot of years doing conventional media stuff, which was basically choose these sandals or choose these ones. Mm -hmm. I'm now an activist and I'm not really content to do that. I want to make change and I'm kind of a, you know, want to make a fuss until it changes. So I'm passionate in that regard that I'd like yeah. to see the industry do better. And and um, and can you 
can you maybe can you tell us who or or what shaped you and, and what made you go from, as you say, selling fashion to really, you know, being an advocate for sustain for sustainability in fashion or more positive fashion? Yeah. I mean, I want to ask you that, even though we're swif- switching places. I've been yeah, I'm not answering any questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I will ask you that. But for me, I think it was just discovering the problems that the industry had. And when I hadn't known those problems, then I was blissfully ignorant, didn't care. Mm. But when I worked out that we, for example, as an industry, have an enormous carbon footprint, or when I worked out that you know, opaque supply chains hid terrible atrocities when it comes to human rights within the industry that I work in. I wanted to change that. And so it was really just a process of discovery that made me want to take action. And I feel like people relate to this. Yeah. You know, you hear it all the time. I, I talk to people who, who've said, gosh, well, I'm going to stop buying clothes for a year or I'm going to um, only buy from brands that publish their sustainability goals and strategies. And this is happening. And this is because people find out, don't they, that everything's not hunky-dory with what they oh. accepted must be fine. I think it's not just fashion. It's all sorts of industries that, or all sorts of systems that we live within and products that we buy and ways in which we live that we just take for granted they must be fine. But mm. then when we find out there are all these problems, we wake up and we go, well, actually we could do better and I think that's kind of my story what happened to you <laughs> what I see you can't, Denmark you can't you? From your Denmark is very sorry I'm interrupting you but I feel like Denmark's super sustainable I feel like is it cultural that there's a kind of move you were early adopters with this stuff right yeah no I think uh, my story just uh in brief um is I think I've always been I've always been very conscious of um, of the environment of our planet. Uh, my dad used to work uh, for the uh, Ministry of Environment here in Denmark for I didn't know that. several decades. Yeah, so I grew up, you know, having conversations around the dinner table and trying to, I mean, as any kid would do, understand what does my parent do for a living and why do you care about it? Um, so I think it 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 shaped me from you know an early age i we also because of my dad's job went on to live in in egypt in cairo um oh, yeah. for four years and he was still working he was working as um as an advisor to the egyptian environmental ministry and so obviously uh, moving from denmark to cairo i think really visually uh, was an eye opener to you know, the consequences of human behavior, human actions to the, you know, environment. So, so I've been exposed and I've been conscious from an early age, but like you, I've, I have always um, been super, super interested in the fashion industry. I'm not like, a, and I hate in general, I hate the word slave to fashion, but I've, I was never like super, um, uh, I don't know, I, I was never, you know, I would never die for fashion. So, uh, but I've always uh, enjoyed fashion and appreciated fashion and especially, you know, the dynamics of our industry. I think this is super, super interesting what's happening. But um, having worked at the global fashion agenda, I think that, I mean, I think it was my luck, actually. Yeah, that'll do it. (laughs) Because I think if, if I had only worked for, you know, fashion brands, or as I did uh, early on in my career, also under Eva Kose, who, you know, um, the Danish Fashion Institute, um, whose, you know, primary purpose was to promote Danish fashion companies internationally. So if, if my job had continued in that direction, maybe I could have potentially turned my back more and more on, you know, my my prior, you know, consciousness of the environment. Um, and, or, and- we sort of, or we sort of separate them. So mm-hmm. we say, well, I care about the environment, so I'll do the best I can yeah. with the things that seem obvious to me. I'll try to drive less. Obviously, everyone cycles exactly. and Copenhagen. Yeah. But yeah. I'll, I'll grow vegetables. I'll try not to eat meat, whatever it is. But actually, I think yeah the the problems that beset the fashion industry globally are only now becoming really widely known and people just didn't know about them a few years ago or only knew about them if they were specialists and that's I think that's a really interesting thing and we've really seen it change I mean now I feel like every news story I read about fashion has a sustainability angle yeah so it's good things are really changing it is fantastic I also I the other day I saw um, and it was an analysis about uh, the creative industries in Denmark. And 
And you wouldn't believe how much more we talk about sustainability in fashion compared to the other creative industries. I think it's like, it, it was a, a discourse analysis and, and you know, I think the fraction, or I think it was like around 50% of what's being written about fashion has to do with sustainability in fashion here in Denmark. We've done uh, a good job of making everyone pay attention, right? And I think that's I think, a good- uh, There's definitely been a movement, let's say, yeah, for sure. But Claire, because, you have been, as I mentioned in the beginning, you were part of our sustainability, uh, or you are part of our sustainability advisory board, and you were also advising on our three-year sustainability action plan, which, and I'm just going to say it uh, quickly to our, our viewers, um, for those of you who don't know, which will culminate in us um, setting minimum standards for brands in order for them to be a part of Copenhagen Fashion Week from 2023 on. And Claire, you were you were not just involved. I think you were deeply involved because I think I believe you also like put a comma or inserted a something uh, <laughs> down to the like a little textual uh, meanings and everything. But uh, fantastic. So I want to now ask you, as as you know, our um, the sustainability requirements um, cover the entire spectrum and the entire value chain of a company and we'll be asking minimums you know asking for minimum standards in each and every one of those areas in which or are there any areas where you believe we as a fashion week especially can have a big impact moving forward I mean what I would say is that the plan is extremely comprehensive and detailed and if people are watching this and aren't familiar with it go and read about it because If you look at what's happening internationally, this is way ahead of anything that anyone else is doing. And it's really full on. It's like, okay, what are you doing with materials? What are you doing with zero waste? What are you doing with setting goals for sustainability and frameworks to look at them? Are you looking at the SDGs? Are you setting climate targets? It's really, really comprehensive. And so for me, that is, well, I would just say like, let's be excited about that because it's not common. And to set that benchmark high and to say, okay, you've got to do these things as a minimum in order to show Otherwise, we can't have you on the on the schedule. That's incredible. It's very bold. But I think what's great about it is also that you then get extra points to do more things. So you're not making it impossible for people to move forwards and be part of this process. But you're saying we are setting quite a high benchmark. We want you to really commit, but then we're going to move with you. So I really like that there are these extra and they're again, very detailed things that you're asking brands to start doing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's better if you can do more of these things and it comes down to quite a granular level. So even things like I was looking at the show, the show ones recently and just saying like, okay, you can't do this unless you have zero waste set design. But also we want you to think you can't have paper invitations. You can't have goodie bags. And I was thinking that just before about talking to you about that. We're actually asking for people to unlearn all of the ways they're used to doing things. And of course there are solutions. But as an industry, we promote things at shows through goodie bags. Clients who are going to help you pay for what you're putting together want to be able to put a little gift or a flyer or something in this bag or, you know, a sample, whatever it is. And to actually say we're not going to do that is is really inconvenient. <laughs> and I was thinking, OK, inconvenience is, is fine. It's better than end of the world. But actually, you're a, it's a big ask. You're asking people to unlearn what they do and then inconvenience themselves to redesign the system to do it in a different way. And so I just feel like that's amazing. And I love that you're pushing it and you're trying to make people do it. And I wanted to ask you, how do people react? Are they like, oh, this is too hard? No, and actually, it's funny that you mentioned the goodie, pa- the, the goodie bag thing, because it was... It, was well, it seems that- little, but it's not little. It's systemic. No, but, and, and you're completely right. It, it, was, a, it was a big thing uh, of, you know, of, of any show, but it's actually something that I've, um, that I've, I've always disliked. Um, I think oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's waste. And um, when I used to uh, go to shows a couple of years ago and I would come back with, I mean, and if you go to 30 shows, then you come back with a lot of samples that, you know, some of course will, you know, come in handy or you can re-gift or, but let's just be honest, too much trash. And um, and um, I was, we actually started 
talking about this two years ago um, when I started uh, doing, our, or when, when we initiated our, our sustainability work at Copenhagen Fashion Week. Mm. And I would say already now, almost no brands have goodie bags any longer. Right. And I think just... we've, been, we've been publishing a, a very, um, it's, it's a very, you know, hands-on guide to a more responsible show for the past two years, of course, you know, updating it every season uh, to reflect new knowledge or new perspectives. But one of the, one of them, I think it's around, is it 12, maybe 12 tips um, yeah. that, we, that we give to brands of uh, how to do a more responsible show. And one of them is, you know, ditch the goodie bag. Honestly, we don't, no one needs them except for, and, I un understand well. of course also the dynamics, but but I, it turns out it hasn't really been a big a big deal breaker. I think that's great, but I feel like the big things are obviously not whether or not you get a free hand cream or whether or not you have your garments delivered to the show site in plastic rather than in something that you can re or single use plastic rather than reusables. But I think that those small things or the low hanging fruit are actually things that people resist because they say, well, hang on, no, this is how we do things. And that idea of how we always do things is one of the kinds of barriers to big change. And I feel like once you, it sounds, I don't know, I've been thinking about this a lot, like how do we spark change? Is it, obviously we've got big us, we need people to drastically reduce their carbon footprints, not just offset, but reduce. We need people to pay a living wage. I mean, huge things, important and vital things. So are we wasting our time saying, oh, hang on, let's just talk about whether or not you are going to reuse the design backdrop for your show. But actually, I think that's how we start big change, by saying to people, every little thing is cumulatively important. Mm -hmm. And that by shifting your perspective on, it's how we've always done things. That's yeah. how you can make yeah. everyone move. And I actually find that I was thinking before about how do we talk about the importance of fashion weeks when we're talking about global war global warming or loss of biodiversity. They seem like, you know, the giant stuff and the little stuff. But I actually think that the public facing nature of a fashion week and the publicity opportunity that it gives to people wanting to raise big issues and start conversations is really important. And the little things are hugely important as well and also I don't see it in other fashion weeks I've I, I mean until COVID I was going to all the fashion weeks all over the place and nobody thought about this stuff or they hadn't yet begun to implement change on this stuff it's, um I really um I mean of course this has taken us uh it took us a year to develop this and I'm not going to say that that we didn't spend time on it um it was immensely time consuming, not only for us, but also, you know, for the people that we involved. And, and we were, I mean, we we're so lucky to, to have, you know, the, to experience so much goodwill uh, from our, you know, uh, sustainability community, if you can call it that. Um, and people who really wanted us to help or saw the potential of, of and I think, I think the potential that everyone sees both, you know, the people who have contributed to our work, but also the brands that are part of the fashion week is that, you know, we are a fashion week is a is a is a huge platform, not just in in you know the sheer volume of how many brands participate and guests and how many collections and all of that. Um, but but it's it's a platform that has an immense power because we have a voice, as you say, the public, um, their eyes um, are you know, uh, you know, they're, they're focused or they're, they're interested in, in knowing what goes down at a fashion week. So, mm. so we have the attention. And I think, you know, that is, that's the key word. We have the attention of, of consumers uh, or citizens, whatever we should, citizens, mm. let's call us, uh, you guys, citizens. We have the attention of citizens, press, buyers, uh, the whole fashion ecosystem twice a year for several days. So we... I think it's it is our obligation to use that in a wiser way to not only generate interest around collections as such, but maybe also, um, of course, more appreciation around the creativity that goes on at Fashion Weeks. But also, you know, the sustainable transition. Let's face it, we need it. There's a, we can't we can't continue doing what we're doing. 
But it's it's also a big question, isn't it? Like, should we even have fashion weeks? Should yeah. we have fashion? Yeah. Should we make clothes? And I mean, because I mean, if you work in sustainability, yeah. you actually grapple with this stuff as well as should we try to set a zero waste strategy? But actually, I think I was thinking about this before. We I don't believe we should have no fashion weeks. I don't think that we should have no um, live theatre, no music, no gigs, no... I mean, entertainment, full stop. And Fashion Week is partly entertainment. It's partly the arts. It's partly a communication of a theatrical idea of yeah. whatever is the inspiration behind what you have created. I always, I I always think refer to it as... Still have it. Yeah, exactly. I always refer to it as, you know, the celebration of, you know, insanely hard work of, you know, how a, a brand gets, you know, starts from, you know, the shaping of, an, of a collection to you know, just before, you know, marketing. And so so I think it's a celebration of say of of this, you know, insanely hard work, as well as it's it's um it's a needed force in terms of um yeah, future proofing businesses. But so, I also think that it, it yeah. I think it had become as a cis as a global circuit or circus, if you like, overblown. And I was by the end of it going to shows that were so big and unnecessarily grand and excessive that you would think well actually something's got to stop here something we've gone out of balance and something has to give and i think we're in an interesting transition now where we have to figure out like how can we retain the heart and soul of what our industry needs to continue to tick creatively but how can we do that without being just profligately wasteful and crazy thoughtless about what the imprint and footprint of that looks like so it's such an interesting time right I don't think it should just be digital I think yeah. it should be yeah. I think we need that coming together but I also think we need to rebalance what it looks like in terms of excess and Claire and and I must say I completely agree with you because I think the beauty of the fashion industry is that it reflects society you know it, it reflects individuals it reflects movements in the society but once fashion shows become so you know so excessive as you're saying that they're out of sync out of balance with the society it's no longer the true reflection so and, mm. and, and that's how i think that we should really i mean that's that's the core of how of course brands should continue to creatively express you know their um, you know, their their view on society and whatever else it, it inspires them, but in a way that's in sync and definitely not like mm. out of touch with, yeah. with society. Reality is okay. It's okay that it's not, you know, completely realistic because we should also be able to dream and, you know, close our eyes and, and you know, and, and feel the feel the creativity of the fashion industry. But um, yeah, it's it's such an interesting time, isn't it? Because I also think we are seeing fashion weeks become not only obviously we are through digital, but that because runway was challenged, brands and designers and creatives are trying to think of new ways to storytell. And it may be a film and it may be a panel discussion. And it's just around how do we keep that vibrant and make that feel personal and not just um noise because there's so many discussions right there's so many films so how do we how do we make it have a point of view a real identity and a real clear force to connect and i think that's what copenhagen does really well so i think that it's just a really interesting time to see that come through and i guess that's what i would that's kind of what i want to talk to you about today that i think that point of view is so important and Copenhagen Fashion Week has a very clear point of view which you set from the start which is we are trying to make sustainable change yeah. along with all the rest of it and that's you know that, that's have, a reason isn't it as a an, purpose yeah and we have an industry that wants to be a part of it because and I think especially you know after this you know one year of um, of experiencing you know the the consequences of a pandemic I what I'm what I'm sensing right now is that the industry that's a part of Copenhagen Fashion Week definitely recognizes this this vision of of going into a more sustainable direction and supports it um, because it is the only way to to really you know future proof their company and it is going to be the um, competitive advantage I think for for most fashion brands going forward and at least that's what I'm hoping but Claire as as one of uh, maybe my last question or one of my last questions 
I, I wanted to ask you also, so besides fashion weeks and, and what we're doing, do you see anyone else in the you know, fashion ecosystem who could um, also be a, you know, a driving force and maybe even a much bigger driving force for you know, the sustainable transition of the industry? Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't think it's down to fashion weeks globally anywhere to be the driver of change. I think they're part of it. I think they can be part of it because of we talked about before they they have that public facing power but i think it has to i mean this is always such a cliche to say we all have to do it together mm -hmm. but it's the truth it has to be many different players coming together to move the thing forwards and that to me comes down to education mm -hmm. it comes down to cross industry organizations like i don't know pick one um the un climate charter fashion industry charter for climate action sorry yeah. um so there are lots of cross industry platforms that allow brands to come together and work collaboratively to change processes and set goals around being more sustainable and those things do matter but i actually think that education is almost as important or even more important i don't know i'm not going to rank them yeah. but i think that getting the next generation of designers and citizens let's not say consumers to ask for a different kind of fashion industry is just as important and then obviously i mean you can't say any of this without saying we must regulate yes. i mean yeah. um look at what france and sweden are doing around um requiring um brands and businesses to take responsibility for end of life i think that when we see regulation move forwards and education move forwards and more brands join these big collaborative efforts, then we, we will see change. And you know what, it, we already are. Yeah. So actually, I feel quite hopeful. I think it's already happening. Yeah, I am quite hopeful as well, Claire. I, I, I mean, still a lot of work needs to be done, but I'm even also, I mean, at least here in Denmark, I'm also sensing that um, speaking of politics and regulations or whatever structures are needed in order to motivate um, either forbid or motivate the industry um it's it's happening here in denmark as well so i'm also quite quite hopeful what about let's just finish on designers nest because it's my favorite oh. and i saw you were doing instagram stuff recently about it yeah. but you never meet an emerging student or graduate designer who isn't like all about this who isn't like mm. well, my way of working will not be the way that you lot did it i'm all about upcycling i'm all about social justice yeah. and i feel like those that's that's also why we need fashion week yeah. to be able to see these new collections from these incredible new voices that are yeah. going to do it differently they're they're just they're born in you know into an, an era of taking more responsibility and um and i think it's probably common for all of the of all of them design uh, institutions and schools around the nordics that participate in designers nest that that you know sustainability uh, courses or lines teaching is um, is is a necessity and um, and I think um, I I actually spoke to someone the other day who um, who didn't want to cha challenge it obviously because it's so needed it's so important but one thing that we must never ever ever kill is creativity because um, if a fashion school feels more like a sustainability school then we might. You know, we, we shouldn't come to a point where we limit, uh, you know, really creative uh, spirits in applying for, for fashion schools. So it's but they, about they're gonna look back, back. But they're born with it. They're going to look back at us and go, oh, my goodness, yeah. you seriously had all that plastic. You used to give away random flyers for no reason. You used to fly to 40 different fashion weeks. You know, they'll just go, what were you doing? Yeah, <laughs> Don't you think? Agree. Claire, it was Fantastic seeing you again. I haven't seen you for a long time. I mean, in person, it's been two years. Virtually, it's been maybe a year or something. I'm, I'm thrilled that you uh, that you wanted to be the first guest in Vice Versa, this new interview series. Um, I'm not the born interviewer, but I think uh, you did an immensely fantastic job as interviewee. I know you've done it a few times before as well, but um, thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Claire.
And thank you everyone for tuning in today for the first uh, uh, interview in our series called Vice Versa. Super honored, as I said, to have Claire Press as our first guest. We can't wait to be back again in one month with our next guest. Stay tuned on Instagram as we announce the name of our next, of our next guest. Thank you so much. Bye.